So today, welcome back to Diabetes Bootcamp. This is our sixth session in this program. And what we're going to be covering today is really all about risk reduction, steps that you can take as a person with diabetes to make sure you're reducing the risk of some of the side effects of long-term diabetes. Of course, we're talking about complications. But first, before we do that, I'm going to give you some, some questions to ponder to yourself. We don't have to answer them right now. But for those of you that did the homework and, and are monitoring your blood sugar, ask yourself, what did you learn from those blood sugar readings? Did you find that certain certain foods or certain activities had a unexpected impact on your blood sugar? Remember, there's a lot of variables that go into uh, determining what your blood sugar is. And some of them aren't under your control. And the purpose of this activity was to really kind of help shed some light on that and, and make you understand how certain things throughout the day, independent of food or activities, can also impact your blood sugar. Because so, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, creating stress and anxiety each time you look at a blood glucose reading. So that's why we're trying to try to minimize using words like tests or good blood sugar or bad blood sugar. And we just say within range and outside of range. And when we look at these numbers and it's outside of the range, we can ask ourselves, okay, what could I have done differently to impact this result? And sometimes there is nothing that you could do. So it's important to keep that in perspective as we move forward. So I'm going to go ahead and and share the rest of my screen here and clear the video. All right, very good. So if we look at some of the complications of long-term diabetes, these are things that we've all are familiar with. And the common theme among each of these complications is as we live with diabetes, and if we keep our blood glucose levels within optimal ranges, we can minimize our risk of ever experiencing any of these complications, whether it has to do a stroke, blindness, a heart attack, kidney failure, recurrent infections, nerve damage. When we look at all the steps to minimize complications, the common denominator is optimal blood sugar control. But it's also helpful to engage your team in this control. As I said from the outset, diabetes is a condition that you're in control of. You're the leader of this whole thing and you look to your healthcare team for support and follow-up and that's exactly what we are here for and a lot of times you'll get the questions like well when when should i see a diabetes educator or when is the best time to go and there's a couple of uh times of the year or times in your life where it's really important to see a diabetes care and education specialist and the first of course is when you're first diagnosed uh, understanding all the impact that diet and medications and activity can have on a person with diabetes. I also believe that it's good to see them once per year, which are also the same as our standards of care. So when we look at these four op, uh, these four opportunities, these are all part of our standards of care. So when you're first diagnosed, at least once a year, any changes that may affect your self-management, whether your living conditions have changed or or anything else that may have impacted how you manage your own diabetes, or if you've had changes in your provider, your insurance, or your living situation. So these are other times where it's very important to see uh, a diabetes educator. So I'll use that term preferentially diabetes educator only because when they changed our credential um, from certified diabetes educator to certified diabetes care and education specialist, I feel like that's a mouthful. I don't know why I had to be so long. So we'll just stick with diabetes educator. So first, when we look at risk reduction, want to revisit one of the measurements that we discussed last week, and that is the A1C test. So when we look at some of the simple things that can be done to really lower our risk for diabetes complications, one of them is our hemoglobin A1C. We discussed it last week as how the the test actually evaluates average blood sugar, but your provider might have a specific target for you. When we look at overall A1C levels for persons with diabetes, less than 7% is typically the range that we're striving for, but depending on any other medical conditions or situations that might be going on for you, 
uh, there might be a different level that your healthcare provider would like for you to achieve. And if it's on target, you're really checking this likely only twice per year. Up to four times a year, you could check it. But remember, any more frequent than that, it's not going to do anything to assess change because it's really only a three-month measurement. If we look at some of the complications of diabetes, so this is really in relationship to type 1 diabetes, but also the same can be extended, I think, for type 2 diabetes when we look at the results of the, the landmark diabetes control and complications trial. One of the things that they were able to estimate is the relative risk of complications with the eyes, the kidneys, the nerves, based on A1C levels. And you can see as it goes up from 7 to 8 to 9, 10, 11, our, our risk for each of these complications increases dramatically. So it's important to note because when we look at diabetes risk for complications and with blood sugar being the the main indicator there, it's important, I think, to understand what actually happens when we look at high blood sugar, specifically as it relates to heart disease and other complications. So I put this slide up here just to kind of review that aspect of it. So when your blood sugar is too high, it, your blood vessels, they basically become sticky. Those particles, they can collect on the blood vessel walls and really lead to a plaque buildup. And of course, we all know as the plaque increases, so does the blood flow decrease. So there's an inverse relationship there. So as plaque increases, blood flow begins to decrease. And if that plaque breaks off, just like you see in that picture there, uh, a, uh, a clot can form in the blood vessel and also lead to a stroke or a heart attack. So what we're really trying to do is minimize these plaques, which is, as I said, can break off and, and lead to a clot and trigger a heart attack or a stroke. So the more often we can keep blood glucose levels within optimal range, the less likely that is to occur. The other thing to be mindful of when we talk about risk reduction is blood pressure. So we all know blood pressure is just the force of blood against our artery walls. Normal ranges is uh, 120 over 80. Now, if you are a person with diabetes and, and um, you have other risk factors present, the real target that we're looking for is trying to keep it below 140 over 90. If it's above that target, that's where medications may be recommended in addition to lifestyle changes. But think about uh, a rubber hose, if you will. So if we use the rubber hose and water pressure analogy. When you turn up the tap on your garden hose, what happens? You know, the, the side effect is you increase the water output, but also that increases the pressure on the hose too, and it becomes more firm and harder to bend. And this is similar to what's happening in your blood vessels, in your arteries, because you have extra fluid in them because of the extra uh, or the elevated blood pressure. Now, this can be triggered by eating too much salts or other medical conditions too. So it's important to be mindful of blood pressure, especially with diabetes. And the consensus here is just treating it to target uh, can be just as important as blood glucose management to reduce our risk for complications. When we look at what we're trying to achieve with blood pressure, it's all about following prescribed medication. So if you are a person who has elevated blood pressure and you are given a medication to control it, it's only gonna work if you take it. So any reminders that can help you uh, recall when to take your blood pressure medications are of course going to help you in the long run. We can also uh, see benefits from being more active. Uh, we can see benefits from healthier eating. Probably the two biggest dietary programs that can have the most impact on our blood pressure are the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diets. And we discussed these briefly in some other uh, of our nutrition talks before. But when we look at each of these programs, the Mediterranean diet is, is uh, not only beneficial for our blood pressure, but we've also seen results where it can uh, decrease our A1C. But regardless, the best healthy eating program for you is going to be one that you can sustain. And it's one that we can talk about one-on-one -on -one as we meet um, 
after this program too. So when we look at the types of programs that have a, a lot more favorable results on our blood pressure, those are the two that typically come to mind. So as a, a little bit of a review, when we look at the DASH diet, we have a increased intake of fruits and vegetables. We also see with that higher fiber amounts because we're using more whole grains. Uh, we see inclusion of lower fat dairy products instead of full fat. So we're, we're usually going to see more conservative, conservative intake of things like butters and cheeses and some of those full fat dairy products. And then also uh, a plan that's lower in total fat and saturated fat as well. So you'll see less prime cuts of meat, less uh, chicken legs and wings and thighs and things like that that are higher in fat. You're going to see lower amounts of those. And when we have individuals on this type of diet program, it usually begins to work within two weeks. So after about two weeks, we can see a pretty uh, noticeable reduction in blood pressure. So remember, we're talking about blood pressure here. We also see reduction in blood pressure with the Mediterranean diet, but unlike the DASH diet, research trials have also shown that the Mediterranean approach to eating also reduces A1C levels. And if we look at the components of a Mediterranean diet, we all think of red wine, but really that's the least critical part of the Mediterranean diet. If it had to be very mindful of alcohol intake. So if you are consuming alcohol, it needs to be one to maybe two servings per day, um, or those health benefits are pretty much erased. We also see with this type of approach, we see more whole grains, nuts, beans, healthier fats, um, less red meat and more seafood and poultry about twice per week on average. But really, rather than focusing on what type of diet to approach, I usually try to encourage people to look at some of the common denominators in these types of meal approaches. And typically what that means is an emphasis on non-starchy vegetables. So those are all your salad greens, your broccoli, your carrots, your cauliflower and things like that. We're going to minimize added sugars and refined grains. So all of those refined grain products like white bread and white rice tend to be a little bit more problematic for us, not just for blood glucose, but also for heart disease risk. And then we want to encourage more whole food consumption versus ultra processed foods. So again, this isn't new information, but I think it's important to be mindful that we give just as much attention to our blood pressure if it's elevated as we do to our blood sugar when we look at overall risk reduction. One of the things that's very helpful, and just like home blood glucose monitoring is helpful to keep our glucose levels within range, so is blood pressure monitoring. But here's some things to keep in mind. If, if the doctor has recommended that you should do uh, home monitoring of blood pressure, Try to find those devices that automatically inflate and also use upper arm placement. Those tend to be more accurate than the ver the uh, varieties out there that go around your wrist or your finger. Okay, so I think that would be the way to go um, in terms of blood pressure management. If you are somebody that is monitoring blood pressure or needs to monitor blood pressure at home, there are several models that are available out there to you that can be pretty economical and also be still very functional. But typically the common theme here is trying to stick with those that have the cuff that goes on your upper arm and automatically inflates. Now you can use the publicly placed ones that you find in a lot of drug stores, but uh, most of those aren't well maintained, so they might be more prone to error. So some things to keep in mind. So a lot of times people will say, well, I get the white coat syndrome. So my blood pressure is always elevated in the, in the doctor's office. Well, home monitoring of blood pressure can be one way to work around that. In addition to blood pressure, you know, really making sure we're aware of what our lipid levels might be is another way to ensure that our risks are being reduced to the best level that we can. So when we look at lipid levels, typically think of cholesterol, but we're looking at the complete lipid profile, which would include your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol. So think H for helpful, L for lousy. That's typically how I've remembered it all these years. So having readings of each of those is important to do on an annual basis for most individuals. And when we look at those target ranges, 
the actual numbers that might be best for you are going to really be dependent on any other risk factors you might have. So if you have a history of high blood pressure or family history of heart disease, these might impact the actual target that your healthcare provider wants you to hit. But for the most part, we're looking at an LDL of 100 or less and an HDL of over 40 in men and over 50 in women. So when we look at ways to really influence each of these numbers, the LDL is largely influenced by diet, at least things that we can control. So LDL, we can reduce through diet. HDL, we can increase through physical activity. So those are the two areas to really favorably impact each of those lipid levels. And then for triglycerides, the target is 150 or less. So a lot of times throughout both campuses, both here in Jacksonville, as well as in Gainesville, we'll offer biometric screenings where you can get these numbers uh, right on the spot. So if that opportunity becomes available to you, I would encourage you to take advantage of it. It's a free way to really uh, take a closer look at each of these numbers too. If we were to kind of take a look at the relationship between our bad cholesterol levels and the hardening of the arteries. Here are some numbers that we've uh, out of the um, Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And what you can see here is without trying to get into too much of the nitty gritty here is the percent increase in risk of atherosclerosis as LD level, LDL levels increase. So here are the LDL levels on the bottom axis here. And again, you can see as we start to get above 100 here, that risk starts to increase and it continues to increase as the numbers go up. So bottom line is the higher the LDL, the greater the risk of atherosclerosis. So that's why that number is scrutinized so carefully when you are having it checked. And that's also why your healthcare provider may recommend a statin to help get that number within um within range. Two two other areas that I would recommend that you you have routine follow up on are going to be your eyes and your feet. All right, when we look at eye health, the recommendation is typically having your eyes checked every 1 to 2 years with a dilated eye exam. So what that dilation enables the ophthalmologist to do is look in the back of the eye to see what might be going on back there to try to get a closer look at those blood vessels, see if there's any leaking fluid uh, from them, see if there's any attention that needs to be made. There is there is early treatment can can slow the progression a vision loss, but I won't reverse it. So it's really important to have a look inside those eyes. Maybe only every two years around, you know, the, the progress of, of where you are in your diabetes care. But if you haven't seen an ophthalmologist for a dilated eye exam and you have diabetes, I would schedule that appointment sooner rather than later, because it's always good to get a, uh, an inside look there so we can catch any problems before it becomes more of an issue and trying to get that part of your routine care schedule moving forward. The other area, as I said, would be your feet. So some tips to keep in mind, we talk about day-to-day -day foot care for persons with diabetes. So remember, these are all diabetes specific recommendations and it might be slightly different than what a friend or a relative or a neighbor might be doing for their own personal foot care, okay? When we have peripheral neuropathy, it's typically first seen in the feet anyway. So checking those feet daily for any non-healing wounds, uh, making sure you have an annual foot exam with a podiatrist, they can screen for any circulation issues. Keep your feet covered when you're outside because what we're trying to do is really just minimize risk of stepping on something that could pierce the skin and lead to an infection and therefore a delayed wound healing. So keep them covered, not just when you're outside, but inside too, you know, I, I I try to wear socks around the house just as a just a, as a little precaution and make sure I'm not stepping on anything uh, that might cause just a little bit of injury that becomes more of a problem later on. Keep them clean and moisturized, but I would avoid putting lotion between the toes. All right, so again, by keeping lotion between the toes, you're going to increase the moisture too much, and it could lead to some fungal infections. Perhaps put you at risk for infe uh, fungal infections there too. Avoid soaking, avoid sharp instruments on the skin. Again, we don't want to pierce the skin unnecessarily 
and lead to an increased risk for infection. So bottom line, see a foot doctor every year. Avoid any of the drugstore remedies for warts and calluses. Ask your podiatrist when you see that individual, see what might be best for you for that if that's a condition that you have. So get those eyes checked regularly, get those feet checked regularly. And then when you're seeing your healthcare provider, they'll also do additional lab work to see how the kidneys are doing. So again, kidney failure is uh, another serious complications of long-term uncontrolled diabetes. And some of the things that we can look at to assess kidney function would be a urine albumin to creatinine ratio, your, your creatinine levels, your estimated GFR is another way to assess kidney health. And if any of these are above the target uh, that's deemed optimal for you, your healthcare provider might prescribe an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So these are some of the medications that we were covering in our uh, medication talk. What these actually do is they, they seem to help protect kidney function. And so if you're given that, it's really just more of a prophylactic measure to help keep those kidneys healthy. So even if your blood pressure level is within range, um, you might be asked to start an ACE inhibitor if your uh, renal targets are outside of where, uh, where it's recommended. So our eyes, our feet, and then of course our kidneys. But, you know, I think more importantly than anything is the mental side of things. So when we look at people with diabetes, they tend to be two to three more times likely to have depression. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for stress and anxiety, you know, especially when we look at all the different tests that we are doing and, and try to, to assess where we are. Um, therapy typically usually works better than medication, you know, taking time to relax, uh, staying active, finding out what activities give you the most mental benefit, whether it's going for a walk, taking a warm bath, spending some time outside, watching a funny movie, whatever it is that works best for you, making sure you channel that into your day-to-day -day routine is going to be very important because diabetes distress is very real. It can look like depression or anxiety, but it's very real. So focus on you know one or two management goals with your diabetes care, whether it's around your diet or your activity, instead of trying to take everything on at once and then talk to your healthcare team if you feel that these conditions that you're experiencing regarding some some stress and anxiety or decision making is impacting your quality of life okay so let's do some problem solving reducing risks with real life scenarios here so first here's a scenario for you i don't feel comfortable making suggestions to my doctor about my care yeah, doctors seem rushed. You're in and out of there pretty quickly, so I don't want to throw too many questions on them. Here's another scenario. I can't do a proper foot exam because I have trouble reaching or seeing my feet. Not uncommon. How can we work around that? Or let's say, you know what? Between the eye doctor, the foot doctor, my endocrinologist, my PCP, I can't keep up with all these appointments, let alone the guidelines around them. How do I help? that person. So here are some potential solutions. All right. First thing to remember here is when you're seeing your doctor, you have the right to ask questions. And, and it's important you know that. So ask questions of your provider of what they do and do not recommend and ask why. All right. So it's important to remember you have that right as the patient to do that. As far as the foot exam, uh, I found that using a mirror is a good way. So holding that mirror by your foot is a good way to get another um, look closer at those feet just to see if there's any issues. Remember, all we're trying to do is look for anything that is a, a small problem now before it becomes a big problem later. And given that circulation issues, as I said, start first in that in the feet. It's not out of the realm of possibility that you may have stepped on something and hadn't even realized it if you do have some circulation problems. So examine those feet daily and contact a healthcare provider. Something seems out of the ordinary. Another one here, as far as keeping up with your appointments, I'm going to share with each of you after this class a personal care record. So this is just one tool to keep up with all the different types of health checks and, and the numbers for those health checks that, that can you can use to, to help stay on track. Now, it's not the only 
care record that's available, but it's just one tool that might be helpful to you. There's also uh, some tools via your smartphone that could do that, as well as using MyChart, um, the app through UF Health. So when we look at some of the summaries as, as far as the types of health checks for persons with diabetes, again, A1C level every three to six months, blood pressure every visit. And if you have high blood pressure, consider home blood pressure monitoring. Our lipid panel, we want done at least on an annual basis. We want the eyes looked at every year. And again, after that initial visit and, and other visits that, that are within range, your ophthalmologist might may only ask to see you every two years. Uh, kidney function tests, that's part of the lab work that's done um, typically with most of your physician visits. So that's done on an annual basis. And then just getting in to see the dentist as well as the podiatrist on a regular basis. For dental checkups, uh, it says at least every year. Most dentists will say every six months. But again, understanding that you also need to make sure we're paying plenty of attention to our teeth as well. So again, those are some of the recommendations as far as the frequency for each of those health checks. I think one way to stay on top of it is just having it all on, on one sheet of paper or one one uh, visual aid that you can see where you have your your blood sugar records, your blood pressure, your weight, your foot exam, your A1C, and all the other tests that are essential for keeping us healthy and active. So your homework leading us into the last class, which is next week, all about problem solving, trying to develop our problem solving skills and do more situational problem solving here. But the other thing I want to ask you to do is go ahead and schedule a one-to-one -one visit with myself for any more individualized guides. It's not required. It's just encourage. This is where we can kind of maybe map out a more individualized strategy to help you with your own personal diabetes care. Schedule any overdue appointments as needed. So as I said, if you haven't seen a foot doctor in a while or an eye doctor in a while, reach out to your providers to get those scheduled very soon. And then there's also several more resources from the CDC that I'll be sharing with you. So this concludes the sixth session here in this program, Diabetes Bootcamp. I'm going to hang out in the lobby. If there's any questions, feel free to ask them. And until next time, we'll see you next week. Thank you.